Welcome back everybody to me being angry or at least annoyed about the Wheel of Time and this is continuing Lord of Chaos. It's book six. This is about chapters nine to fourteen I think. Thirteen? Something like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we, we'll see what annoyed me this time around and what didn't, right? I guess that's sort of what we do here today. So let's start. Cheers. All right, so um, we kind of continue with those two main stories that is Rand on the one hand and then whatever goes on in Salidar with um, those people, sort of, right? That's sort of the main thrust of this. Plus, one other one that is all about plans, which is what is going down in Amadesia. And yeah, that's, that's the main stuff, but basically nothing much happens. Um, I mean, yeah, some things happen, of course, and we're going to talk about Rand being bonded and shit, right? Um, <clears throat> but that's basically it. Rand wanders uh, down, meets Varen Sedai and Alana Sedai, and Alana just goes and bonds him. He gets pissed off, behaves understandably annoyed, and then sends Mazrim Time out to find more men who can channel. And that's that's all the actual action. Now, obviously, some of those are huge implications. Probably, I guess. Or maybe not. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, plans is mostly Pedro Nile being delusional. <laughs> more gays starting to build a power base again, or failing. We will see. Um, well, now, uh, and the third one is obviously all the action going down in um, Solidar with a possible reconciliation with the White Tower and Elida, plus, um, you know, them trying to find crap, and um, yeah. We will talk about all of those things. Also, Elaine has a... not Elaine. Um, Egwene! Right, we meet her for the first time in a while. She has a dream, and it's a dream of <laughs> Gawain. And it's... well, it's kind of spicy. Almost. <clears throat> so, um, what? where does that leave us? Um, Let's talk about the first part, and that is um, the plans chapter. It's chapter 9, and it's uh, called Plans, and it's mostly about Petron Nile talking first to his pretend spy master and then to his real spy master. Do we need that setup? Probably not. But then again, you know, whatever. If, uh, if that's Robert Jordan's idea of having, like, devious plans, of having, like, a pretend secret service, like, pretend spy master who doesn't know anything, um, so he gets, you know, so the other one can actually work in the shadows, if that's his idea of intrigue, then who am I to, dis you know, disabuse him of that notion? And uh, I don't. So, yeah, whatever. And um, what we basically see is, I mean, it's once again, those are very slow chapters and it, 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 the overall narrative has bogged down a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to call this the slog because I know some people do and I don't want to, you know, use that word because I don't think it's actually a good idea. I'm just saying it is <clears throat> like when you look at like how much happened in chapters in earlier books, this time around there's like one long elaborate conversation with a lot of like stuff thrown in that we don't necessarily need to move the whole thing forward. There is maybe... And that's the sort of what I guess what happens, which explains why some people are annoyed by these books and others fall in love with them. And that is um, what I called Rococo yesterday, right? It's um, it's um, basically um, the illusion of complexity and complex world building and politics and stuff, especially when you have the Petra Nile stuff and later on the one with, like, the bit with more gays and whatnot. We get, like, a shit ton of information about troop movements and stuff happening, supposedly happening all over the map. And you know what? It's completely unnecessary. It's irrelevant to the highest degree. It's just like names thrown out. Yes, I know if you have the actual maps of the thing in, you know, your uh, book, you can look it up and you can probably go and mark stuff or you can print out the map and put it to your wall and print out little like flags with the different factions and, and play at being a general. But I 
don't think this will actually impact your understanding or enjoyment of the story at all. I think it's just Robert Jordan making the written equivalent of empty noises. Because, yeah, it's basically what we learn from all of this, and we've kind of figured this out before, is things are getting more chaotic. Everyone is playing at intrigue, everyone is playing at chaos, and that's what happens. So, do we need to know where there are so-called dragons sworn? Do we need to know what the, what the prophet is doing? No, we don't. It's, it's completely irrelevant at this point for the story. What we need to understand is that this part of the world, this continent, um, is in upheaval everywhere because everyone is fighting against everyone. It's sort of, you know, a Hobbesian state of nature that is um, has come all over there, come over this part of the world. It doesn't have a name even, right? That's sort of what we learn here. And you know what? I'm fine with it. <clears throat> the other bit that we learn, and this is... I'm I'm having ideas of why I hate this, um, but I can't fully explain. I mean, I can fully explain them yet, but I may be contradicting the reality once I find out more. Once I hit that, you know, read on and find out, which is one of the most arrogant, fucked up things to say. But I've I've said that before, right? All right. So, what do I mean? Um, Basically, what we all learn about Petra Nile here is that he has a very specific idea of how the world is built. He accepts the idea that the Black Aja exists. He accepts the idea of a, you know, break within um, the tower and whatnot. But he still t denies the idea of Rand being the, dr the Dragon Reborn, because, you know, in his mind, it'll all come down to a pure materialist, like, fight between humans and Trollocs on the other side. And now the interesting thing is like, there is no reason why he would think that. It's like, he's fighting all these prophecies and he's fighting uh, the the Aes Sedai and he knows, should know, that Aes Sedai can channel. I mean, this is a fact, right? It's like, why, why is he denying that specific aspect that is tied in with that whole sh the whole thing it doesn't make any sense. Now what we can, how we can like read the white cloaks under um, what's his name, uh, Petron Nile, I guess, is um, to read them as religious fanatics, which they are clearly supposed to be. I mean, I I call them fascists, but I, I assume they're not so much supposed to be like, a, you know, magic Gestapo, they're more supposed to be like the Inquisition, which is why you have those people called the Hand, whatever, the Hand of Light, um, the Questioners, whatever you want to call them. They are people that torture people for answers because they think that they are rooting out dark friends, which is sort of an image of the of the Inquisition. Now, why do I think this can become problematic? Um, a, I guess um, that people like um, that... So, uh, the popular image of the Inquisition is not a very good one. I'm aware of that. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm uh, not going to, you know, go and um, tell you why the Inquisition did nothing wrong. First of all, we need, to, and, and this is, I guess, where we have the first problem there. It's like, you need, that there is a clear different, a difference between what you might call um, the Rome, Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, Roman Inquisition of, say, the 13th century, and um, the one that you didn't expect, which is the Spanish Inquisition in later years. There, there are clear differences in how they operate and so forth. So that's the first bit that it gets lost in a lot of these like very like basic um, portations of the Inquisition to somewhere else. <clears throat> and what we, what we find is the image of the Inquisition as either a bunch of cynical torture fanatics or a bunch of misguided torture fanatics, which does not fully, you know, um, um, how to say, which does not actually, you know, uh, <laughs> do us any good. Because the problem is, either, uh, and this, you can probably split between people that are actually Christian, in this case, I'm talking Inquisition, so I have to use Christian here, right? People that are either Christian, 
Those are the people that talk about the misguided torture fanatics. And there's people who are what you might call non-Christian, atheist, agnostic, whatever. Anti-religious, I would say, is the best word here, right? And those people say, well, they're just a bunch of um, torture fanatics <laughs> and cynical torture fanatics. <laughs> um, but, and that's sort of like the, the two options. Now, I, I think... And then Robert Jordan falls into the former category, and it feels more and more like that, which is the White Cloaks are misguided torture fanatics. Penrod Nile is on the side of the, of the light, of good, which is why he's trying to, you know, fight Trollocs and all of that stuff. But because he's so misguided for whatever reasons, and we'll come into that, I guess, later on, um... He does not believe, uh, he, he, he fights the wrong fight, he causes damage. Not too much damage, actually, but, you know, I mean, yes, a lot of damage, but it's, it's never actually reached the point where you can actually condemn those light, those white cloaks as evil. Or, like, you know what I mean, fundamentally sinners and thus dark friends. They're not, because, you know, the world doesn't work, operate in that like level. But the point is that the white cloaks, as an idea seem to be redeemable, in a way. If Pedro Nile would only, you know, open his mind, which he doesn't do, because he's fundamentally, you know, misguided at this point, and would accept these, um, these aspects, he would have, like, no other choice but to actually ally the Dark Friend, uh, the White Cloaks, with the White Tower and Randall Thor to fight the actual Dark Friends, Forsaken, and whatnot. Will not happen until those fundamentally misguided people will, you know, die, get removed, and so forth. And I do have some fundamental issues with that setup, but, you know, I think I need to read a bit more to actually fully voice why I don't think that's a good idea. Because what it, at the end of the day, what it does is it confirms that, like, underlying Christian ideology that is sort of built into this whole thing, in a way. Um, <clears throat> which I am not 100% happy with. So yeah, um, that's sort of um, the, the main thing in that whole story. We also see how he's kind of using more gays, um, but at the same time we see Pedro Nile as... <clears throat> Because, did I mention that all these characters are fundamentally super, super one-dimensional? Well, he's basically the same kind of one-dimensional bastard, right? What we see is him completely full of himself, overestimating his ideas, and never ever, like, even beginning to question anything else, because he knows how the world works. He's a fundamentalist. He knows how the world works. And um, anything else is impossible. Which is, once again... A, a very flawed image of, uh, of most people in the actual, like, Inquisition. To, to put it mildly. <laughs> there was a lot of, like, questioning your own judgments going down in, in like, actual church history. I'm just saying for, for now. But we, we, we'll see where all of this is going in the future. However, he's, he's basically one half step away from actually winning it all. And here's my prediction. I have no idea. But I'm pretty sure this will all fail. Because so far, the White Cloaks have always been something of a laughing stock. Like, yeah, they're, they're powerful dickheads marching around. But they're basically movie Nazis. They, 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 they're on parade. But they fall down really easily, except, you know, except Gallard, who we will find out what, you know, happens with him in the future. But, you know, apart from that, like, they're basically movie Nazis that get beat every single time through their own stupidity. Um, which makes them very, like, I don't know, I have, like, no interest in what they're doing. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You'll get punished anyway. Nothing, nothing like, of any consequence would come of this. <clears throat> which... I feel already starting to come up here once again when you see in that like second half of it when more gaze is try you know sort of trying to build her power base. <laughs> the only thing that really struck me there is once again how primitive Robert Jordan's like conversations and characterizations are. It it reads like high school intrigue when those like ladies in waiting talk to more gays and try to pull their like small barbs and I'm like maybe I've just read like read too much other stuff but this this reads like it's written for like 14 year olds that read I don't know what do 14 year olds read these days when they're not watching porn on the internet I don't know <laughs> that kind of stuff <laughs> where 
where it's like all like who's mean to whom kind of thing and I'm like I'm pretty sure that's not how intrigue works especially if you look at Queen Morghese who is supposed to be a very you know capable person it's like I guess she's better things she's got better things to do than to you know um uh, <laughs> think about who said what nasty thing about whom. That's not like her metier, uh, her level of competence. So we'll see where all of that, uh, this is going. My guess is it will uh, go nowhere. <clears throat> because the white, white cloaks remain a bit of a punching bag. All right, let's look at the big one here. The big one is obviously the Rand, Varen, whatever chapter. <laughs> Staying in the Borderlands. And what happens is Rand looks at, like, and there will be consequences, I'm pretty sure. So Rand is like, flees from Avienda again, because for whatever reason, we don't really know. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, runs into that um, uh, inn where he finds all those girls from the two rivers that are going to become Aes Sedai, led by Varen and Alana. Alana is like, all right, he's the Dragon Reborn. I'm going to bond him because I'm a green Aja. <laughs> and Rand uh, just uses, uh, over, overawes them all with her, his magic and um, runs away after everyone is afraid and hates him. And then we're probably supposed to think about him going mad again, but who knows. So there's a bunch of things going down here that I find problematic. One of them is like really difficult and problematic. The other one is um, more on the writing side of things. So let's look at the really problematic one and that is an that is obviously bonding and we've seen that before with um, what's her name Elaine doing it to Birgitta. Um, there's a bunch of interesting questions here that I like never have been asked. Uh, I have not asked before. Maybe they don't never. The interesting thing is no one ever asks them within these books, which is like, is bonding something that you can reverse? Because I assume you could. It's a spell. It should not be permanent at all. But apparently it's treated as that. Apart from like more, you know, Moraine being able to send her bond over to like someone else who then is supposed to send it to Nynaeve, I assume. So Lan ends up with Nynaeve. But the question is like, I thought, and there is a scene in, I think it is The Great Hunt, where Mora Moraine is even talking about like, maybe should I, should I like release you from your bond, Lan? And something like that. There's a conversation right before the Drakkar shows up and almost takes her. That scene is what I mean. Um, I'm not going to look it up again. Don't worry. Um, my point is, if bonding is reversible, why has, for example, Elaine not done it yet? I know she kind of bonded Birgitta to save her life, whatever. Now, Alana bonds Rand. And this is obviously, and Robert Jordan, to his credit, is aware of the fact this is a huge breach of consent. Because she just does it. And I don't really know what she intends to do. This is sort of where I find, like problems with it, right? So first of all, yes, bonding someone is very much a breach of consent. It's basically like forced, mar forced marriage, basically, sort of, in a magical sense. Now, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's a big no, obviously. And this is sort of where I find the, the weird thing um, is, once again, in the gender difference, right? So Birgitta gets bonded. She gets pissed off by it, of course. Understandable. It's, you know, no consent. Sucks. But then she does nothing about it, right? She just accepts it. And Rand just uses his big magic dick or whatever and just, like, you know, punches out both Alana and Varen Sedai. He just, like, seals them off from, like, the power and all of this, like, you know, slaps them around. One could argue that it's well-deserved. But my point is... Rand seems to be able to fight back and whatnot. He's not under the control of Alana Sedai at all. Because he's superiorly and magically strong and whatnot. And women can't do that. Not even a tested um, hero of the horn and whatnot, like Birgitta. Apparently not. Um... I'm not going to, you know, interpret this too far, but it, it just kind of 
rubbed me the wrong way that apparently ran just like gets gets bonded and then there's like no further consequence apart from like yeah he kind of feels a connection to Alana Sedina which whatever it doesn't seem to stop him from doing anything is what I'm trying to say here so there's like no consequences it's kind of the same thing I'm, I'm gonna say this now we'll maybe find out more about it in the future. So this is a preliminary issue. Rand has even more plot armor. Remember the whole Balefire thing? So you're not supposed to do Balefire, use Balefire to destroy stuff because it, you know, frays the pattern and shit? Well, Rand used a shit ton of Balefire when he blew up uh, Ravine at the end of Fires of Heaven, right? And there's no fucking consequence, like no negative consequence so far. I mean, the only consequence really was that he brought Avienda and Asmodian and Matt back to life. And that's that. Didn't really help Asmodian, I assume, but, you know, whatever. Um, point is, there's no negative consequences, none whatsoever. It doesn't even get mentioned again. And we're a bunch of chapters in now. We're like, I'm like 10 chapters in at this point. It's like, you should maybe make a note of the fact that you did something that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> Fucking Moiraine even warned you to not do it. And th we start this book with like, um, the dark one talking to Demondred, I think. Yeah, to Demondred about, like, maybe not using Balefire. And we get, like, another, you know, explanation of, like, Balefire being bad. But there's no consequences for, for Rand Balefiring half of the palace of what's it, uh, of, of Camelin. No, because Rand's the dragon reborn, I assume. All right, so there, there's that bit. <clears throat> that I, you know, find annoying. But then again, you know, it's the wheel of time. What can I say? Um... And we probably will talk about the bonding thing again in the future because maybe it will actually have some consequences for Alana or Rand. I hope there will be something at some point because so far it just feels like, yeah, so she bonds you, you punch her, you knock her out, and then you just like go away and just tell her to never come back. And I'm like, that works. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> what I mean is the un like how unrealistic um the whole situation with the girls of Emmons Field is like um don't get me wrong i mean, I, I know they're supposed to be something somewhat backwards because they're from the two rivers and whatnot but the point is rand walks in and no one knows that he is the dragon reborn because apparently no one thought about telling them in like all the weeks i mean i know perrin did not tell them but neither did Varen Sedai nor alana and they're in this bar and Varen knew that Rand is the dragon, and no one told them. So Rand walks in, he kind of managed... <laughs> yeah, and, and even when he's like, I'm the dragon reborn, he just like knocks out two, uh, two Aes Sedai, and then the girl's like, <laughs> stop lying to us, <laughs> stop being, <laughs> stop having such a swollen head. <laughs> Which is that weird, like gender dynamic again that just doesn't make any sense at this point is he he rules like three fucking cons uh, three fucking countries at this point three and those village people are like you know what <laughs> don't lie to us stop being such an idiot <laughs> you're not the dragon reborn like I don't know. He just marched in here with like two bodyguards, <laughs> two groups of bodyguards, <laughs> fucked over two Aes Sedai. They didn't tell you, any. they did not actually object. And you're like, you can't be the dragon reborn. He's like, whatever. Um, so, you know, consistency, coherence is not exactly something that we can expect from these books. Um, so, I don't know about all of that. One interesting tidbit is about Varen, who is becoming more and more suspicious over time. Because she's like, we have that moment from her point of view when it's like, she's, she worked for like 70 years on the whole Rand Dragon Reborn project. 70 years. Rand's 20 years old, and we know that Moraine and Swan Sanche worked for us 20 years, right? Because they... Um, were in that situation at the final battle of the Isle War while Rand was born when the then keeper of the records, I assume it was, there's a scene like early on in Great Hunt, had that like foretelling and she's like, 
yeah, the, the dragon reborn, and that's sort of when those two, Moraine and Swan Sanche, made her their pact. So, for whatever reason, uh, Varen Sedai was already 50 years working on that project before Moraine and Swan even decided. And that's highly suspicious. I'm just saying, this is highly suspicious to me. Um, we will see what will come of all of this. Um, I mean, the rest is more like, you know, what's his name? Mazrim Time is pushing, is pushing and whatnot. And, um, yeah, well, we'll see where all of this is going. I mean, technically, you could, like, probably build something out of Rand... <coughs> avoiding Avienda and then getting bonded by Alana, and that could be, like, interesting potential, uh, like, conflicts there, because he maybe loves Avienda. Um, also, why is he, a, why is, why is he not actually acting on that? Because, you know what, he never made any promise to anyone, apart from, like, maybe not even Egwene, but apart from that, it's like, whatever, he wants to fuck Avienda, he should just do it. He loves her, he could just, like, take her, he's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I will, I'll rather avoid her, like, you're acting like a 13-year-old boy who's afraid of girls, I mean, which is fine. But you're 20. Also, you rule three fucking kingdoms and command tens of thousands of men. You should maybe think about these kind of things. All right. Now let's look at the rest of it. And there is enough going on in the rest that is also kind of weird. So one is obviously um, the horse stealing thing, because <laughs> now Nynaeve asks Brigitte to steal the horses because Nynaeve has forgotten how to steal horses. But I've mentioned that before, so we're not going to go into all of that. <clears throat> the the whole thing of Nynaeve trying to find out how to actually, you know, channel without being angry first is still interesting because from where I'm standing, she's always angry and she's still described like that. But I guess Robert Jordan wants to try to figure out the whole, like, she has, um, she fears stuff kind of thing. Um, whatever. The interesting bits and pieces here are definitely, um, more, um, uh, in the, you know, how everyone is kind of annoying, how Nynaeve is still super delusional, and, you know, trying to flee and whatnot. And there's, like, that whole bit while they're like, shit, we need to do something before the Aes Sedai just like sell us out to the White Tower and it's all done. <sighs> yeah. I guess. <clears throat> and I can probably live with all of that. Um, but we encounter the bubbles of evil and I think, I just still think the bubbles of evil concept is just ridiculously stupid. Just saying, it's a ridiculously stupid narrative convention. And we have a lot of those in here, right? We have, like, we've spoken about some of them before, but there's, like, narrative conventions that Robert Jordan puts in there in your face that suck. Taviran is one of them, definitely. Bubbles of Evil are another one that is just ridiculously stupid, although it's mostly the name of Bubbles of Evil with that whole, like, marsh gas kind of thing. I'm like, I don't know. As a metaphor, it doesn't really, you know, vibe with me. But man, whatever. Whatever floats your boat. Um, or Bubble of Evil, I guess. The next one is obviously when they're in the dream world that if they just concentrate on need, it will actually get them to where they need to be in the dream world to find out stuff. Which is a neat um, fucking trick. And just like, it's never explained why this should ever work. It's like, yeah. So here it is, this is how it works, and you just like jump around and they're like, find that weather control thing in... Whatever city. Um, so yeah, I guess what we'll find. I mean, it just it just feels awfully convenient um, to just build it that way. There's like no no real motivation. It's more like Robert Jones like, oh shit, I need to do something. I've spoken about weather changes all the time. I guess I'd better do something about weather. Um, and I have no idea how to actually get them there. So let's just pull the oh you dream it uh, number. And I'm like. Oh. It just feels, a lot of it just feels, once again, very clumsy and not the way it could could be handled. 
And yeah, we, we still haven't like actually started anywhere. Like my guess now is that like at some point Elaine and Nynaeve wander to that city, get the weather control bowl, feel really good about it. And Rand's attack on Samael will work in some form or other, I assume. Morgays will probably, you know, get over her thing with uh, with the white cloaks and stuff. And then Robert Jordan will just come up with something else stupid. Something stupid that will happen next. We will see. Um, let's talk about the Egwene dream with... Um, what's his name? Gawain. So Egwene dreams and ends up in <clears throat> Gawain's dream and we finally find out, or no, not we finally find out, but finally Egwene realizes how much Gawain is in love with her and how Gawain is like, I can't do this because Galard loves her too and Galard's my older brother and like... <clears throat> so here's, here's the weird thing there. I mean, there's a bunch of weird things there. Obviously, the first one is that Gawain has this weird, like, bondage dream, whatever. Apparently, like, everything has to be bondage here. <laughs> the next interesting thing, this is something that I I generally find weird with um, the entirety of the Wheel of Time so far. <clears throat> but I guess it's sort of built into the whole, like, pattern fuck-up uh, that, that underlies the world, the predestination kind of crap, um, is that <clears throat> love is something that is always an outside force. It's like, it's not about who actually loves whom or who wants to be with whom. It's more like the pattern does this to you. Suddenly you have to be in love and it will find ways for you to actually end up in love, right? The, the idea of like falling in love with someone and then not getting those people will never happen in these books. It's like, it's love at first sight, and then we'll just, like, fuck around with you until the point where it's story-wise convenient to actually have you be warder and warded, or husband and wife. That's just how it'll work all the fucking time. And I'm like... It very much does not represent um, the... Um, complexities of human interactions and human relationships. I'm just saying. That's not how that works. You don't just get to get together with your, like, one true love and that it'll work. It, that's not how life works. Bobby J. Um, but yeah, so we have all of that. Maybe Nynaeve has sort of almost broken through her, like, block. I mean, it, all in all, I like that sort of story idea that she's trying to work on it or is trying to not actually work on it. There's there's some nuance there of, like, us trying to avoid problems in, like, our personality and not work on them that I can see is, like, more than Robert Jordan usually does with characters. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that. I'm not sure if I like the solution whenever the solution comes up. Um, but apart from that, yeah, whatever. Nicholas seems to do like a really interesting um, uh, what's her um, uh, prophecy. So she seems seems to have that weird foretelling thing that Elida sometimes has, which is another one of those. Yeah, some people just can do that. And if I want to drop in like some foreshadowing, I'll just like have one person pop out of nowhere. It's like, oh, by the way, she has the foretelling now. Here you go. We will see. Um, all in all. I don't know. It's 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 not that egregious apart from the, the the falling in love thing and especially the bonding thing where like Rand can just like shrug off the bonding. I mean, I guess they're, they're still bonded, but it doesn't really matter to him now. Whereas Birgitta just accepts the whole bonding thing, the non-consensual bonding, because maybe it was because of necessity. And that's the that's the deeper thing. It's like there is never any necessity for non-consensual like lifelong choices on the earth. That's not how that works. That's not how consent works. I mean, yeah, I guess you can, you know, go and do like a whole like, am I allowed to do blood transfusions on someone who religiously forbids it or whatever? But that's not how that works because bonding is something else. It is explicitly about bonding with another person and that's always about consent in the future. Like, why women apparently just accept it, like being the first female warder that just accepts it and can do nothing about it, even though I'm pretty sure you can loosen the bond later on. And Rand just like, yeah, you do that with me, I'll just, like, knock you out because, you know, it sucks. 
feels once again to that point where it's like, I don't know, do you really have to make clear that women can't ever do anything on their own and always need a man while men can shrug off any form of like supposed intrusion on their power whatever by women I don't know it's it's a bit weird is what I'm saying here um but yeah you know I'm 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 slightly interested to find out if this book ever picks up speed and where this will be going if it ever goes somewhere <clears throat> maybe I'll find out tomorrow who knows? Um, until then, uh, yeah, talk to you soon. Cheers.